I am thrilled to introduce a Smarty Pants with Solutions. I'm really excited about Alex Slocum being here today and I'm expecting some pretty amazing stuff. So just put that out there. Alex Slocum is the Walter M. May and A. Hazel May Professor of Mechanical Engineering at MIT. A McVicker Faculty Teaching Fellow, a fellow of ASME and a member of the US National Academy of Engineering. He has over 130 patents and helped develop 12 products that have received R&D 100 awards for one of the 100 best new technical products of the year. He pioneered the deterministic design of kinematic couplings, including the standard for all semiconductor wafer transport carriers. Now, for all of you who know what that means, and for the rest of us who don't, please welcome to the stage Alex Slocum. All right. Now we're going to have some fun. Let's see if this works. Uh, I don't have my eyeballs on, so let's see which one of these is the laser. Zap. Zap. OK. So first of all, I want to thank um, everybody who came earlier for setting this up really well, because the data was great. I was modifying my talk a little bit in real time, and uh, it was all right on the money. And now my goal is to help you all realize how simple it actually is to fix stuff. And the key is. We're going to think reciprocally. The, 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 the nice person here earlier said uh, the opposite of uh, unhappy. Right, and even stronger, when you're sad, just do the opposite to become happy. Okay. Okay? Now, that's an important thing. So whenever you hear anybody saying, it's too expensive, it'll never work, just remember. God loves you. That's why we have physics to solve problems. <laughs> I'm going to show you how that works. So I'm an opportunist. I listen for people whining. Because if you notice, people complain, like to complain more than fix and do. So that means all of you can fix stuff and make stuff uh, not only happy, but you can make some money. Okay, so. Everybody can have a great job and everybody can profit. It doesn't ha this is not a zero-sum game. And thermodynamically, I can prove it. The Earth is this thing, right? It's a small, controlled thing. So you say, well, but we're on the Earth. If we take something, you know, then we have to give something up. No, 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 no. You got this sun thing going down there that's like beaming herds of energy onto the planet. So we can take all of that we want and do whatever we want with it. Let's just do it nicely and controllably. So there's, there's no limit to the energy that, that we have available. And having said that, I have a little rhyme here. It's very important. Nature and physics do not care. OK, your, your, your parents, your loved ones may care and love about you. Physics doesn't. Look at the hurricane that just tore up uh, the panhandle. So we have no time to spare. Energy from carbon creates global strife. Renewables are the key to an everlasting happy life. Remember that, all right? Now, let's make this thing go forward. So uh, first of all, I want to kick the shit out of all the scientist friends of mine. You cheese breaths. <laughs> Insert stronger word there. Because they say things like, it is unlikely that humans are causing climate change. Bullshit. Humans are causing it. Say it. And don't say, well, there's a 1.15 to the 10 to the minus ninth chance that it may not be humans. So therefore, we cannot, as scientists, say humans are causing it. Bull poopy. Scientists, stop with this science stuff when you're communicating to the rest of us, normal people. And if you're within a tenth of a percent, dang it, it's doing it. So that's the first thing. The humans need, uh, scientists need to say, dudes, we're killing the Earth and ourselves. Stop. Period. Next thing is, everyone can carry forward the messages. I travel a lot. Oh my goodness, like 250,000 miles last year. This year, I mean, already. And I routinely sit next to people on the airplanes, and people are like, well, you know, I don't really think uh, this would happen. You can't prove this. 
So my favorite thing was, you're flying in an airplane, right? Yeah. Please start believing in climate change. Well, why? Because if you don't, the plane's going to drop. Because Navier-Stokes equations for how fluids behave is what's keeping this plane afloat. And that's the same physics that explains why climate change is happening. And oh, by the way, your cell phone, turn that off. And oh, by the way, the plane's going to crash because the GPS system, which depends upon Maxwell's equations, is also what controls electromagnetic radiation, blah, 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 heating up the planet. And if you don't believe in any of that stuff, you can't fly, you can't use your cell phone. Turn it all off, go home, hide in the hole, which would solve our problem, actually. Okay, so it's up to everybody to carry forth that simple message that the physics that allows us to have this life we have was harnessed by the scientists and engineers so we could have this wonderful life. If you don't trust scientists and engineers to, who are telling us that we're going to out you, then you've got to not use anything else. You can't pick and choose what you believe in. And the next thing is, if we're really going to have change, we can have all these conferences we want, but we've got to get the vote out. And I'm sick and tired of hearing about this thing about, you're a rich guy. I'm going to tax you, and I'm not going to take the tax, but I'm going to give the tax to poor people who need the tax, so the zero-sum carbon tax, to make poor people happy about rich people being taxed. Bullshit. Poor people have more to lose from climate change and more to gain from climate fixing, not by taxes, but by jobs. I'm going to show you this in a minute, that the key to solving poverty is not rob from Peter to pay Paul, right? But we all work together because we've got this infinite source of energy coming into the planet for all intents and purposes of the sun. Work together. Everyone can have a great job, and everyone who wants to can make all the money they want. Very simple. So this is a posi message, OK? And here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to go through uh, some of these specific topics. And what I'm going to try to show is whenever you show me a sadness or a whine, how are you going to convert that into a positive? When, and, and can you all see the shirt? We got the shirt to go with it. And we were going to have this printed on the bottles, but we didn't have time. So maybe next conference. He's one over sad equals happy. All right? And uh, uh, we're going to go through all these happy projects, and then we're going to talk about some of this investment stuff, so the actual money banking business side of it, too. So it's not just a happy geek talk. It's a happy everything, OK? So the first thing is we're going to talk about offshore wind. Generally, it's more expensive than land-based turbines. But the nice thing about wind offshore, the wind is much better, and it's closer to where you need it. But you've got to be far offshore to avoid visual pollution. Now, up in the Northeast, uh, you know, we're all a bunch of tree-hugging uh, squirrel nuts and twigs crowds, and we love everything. And yeah, dude, almost as good as California, where I grew up. Unless, of course, you want to put a wind turbine offshore where the rich Kennedy family could see it, then that's no good. Not in my backyard. Fortunately, we have intelligent design. And I have lots of proof for intelligent design. The first one is, OK, I'm going to create this planet where there's going to be lots of people. And I know in the future they're going to need wind turbines. And they're going to have to be offshore. But some of the rich people aren't going to want to see them. So you know what? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to make the thing round. And I'm going to make it round of a diameter that if you, oh, let's see. I know. We'll put it the distance of a marathon offshore that that curved thing, if you go 40 kilometers offshore, you can't see the turbine anymore. Isn't that cool? So whenever it was, you can't put wind turbines offshore because of the whales and the fishes. Bullshit. I just don't want to see it. <laughs> no problem. We'll just put it farther offshore so you can't see it. You see what I'm saying? One over sad equals happy. And then you say, but if you put it far offshore, it's going to be more expensive. Good, I'll make money out of that too. Watch. How many people here like shrimp? I love my shrimp. Shrimp is cheap. It's destroying the mangroves. People like fish. There ain't going to be no more wild fish soon. No problem. We'll make like a fish farm. But when fish, or the goes into and goes out, it goes into food, goes out to go poop. The swim, fish swim in the poop. No problem. I'll put some antibiotics on it. You see that vicious nastiness? But if you put the fish, farm far enough offshore, fish poo, poo from fish sink. If the water is deep, nice fresh water, fish don't get hurt. But you cannot afford to put the fish farm far offshore. It's too expensive. Ha! But if you happen to have a wind turbine out there, 
Now you get two for one. So this is the whole concept of what the old time farmers always knew. And I'm a, I'm a, I, we used to raise sheep until we ate them all. We still have goats and, and alpacas. Um, we never wasted anything except the ba. So the old time farmers know one plus one can equal three. Okay, that's what we're going to do. So, and these are some numbers, and we're not going to go through the numbers here. But the moral of the story is, it's pretty cute. If you put in a five megawatt offshore wind turbine, the amount of energy you're getting from that wind turbine, that wind turbine can now hold a fish ball that will give enough protein for the same number of people that the five megawatt wind turbine uh, serves. Isn't that a cool number? Further evidence of intelligent design. Now, there's a gentleman, uh, Bella Buck is his name, uh, in, in, in Germany who's done a beautiful, re deep, deep research on the offshore wind turbines in the North Sea and how you would do aquaculture around it. So that's a fantastic opportunity. So I think one of the things we need is the competition to catalyze the world. Not an X prize for, oh, you know, can five people build something. Let's have an X prize for between cities. Can we challenge city X like Sparta and Athens? Not challenge each other to who can kill each other off quicker, but who can green each other off quicker, right? So why can't there be a city in the United States? Let's take Houston. And maybe Houston is going to compete with Miami to see who can have the most offshore wind and food. You guys get in the drift, right? That's what we need to do. And uh, even better than that, we're going to need lots of special minerals and to, to build all this stuff. No problem. We can go dig up Africa. We can start a war over there and kill each other over who gets the stuff there to like get enough chromium, to get all the cobalt for our Teslas, right? No, 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 bad. Turns out there's this thing on the planet called rain. Rain falls on mountains, trickles down, and just slowly, slowly through the millennia pulls out the minerals, and it's everywhere in the oceans. And our chemists and scientists over the past many decades have been working on happy little polymers that will suck the minerals out of the water. We now have those. I had a graduate student, Maha Haji, that was her doctoral thesis, was how to take the magic plastics that the chemists have come up with and turn it in a way to actually now absorb the minerals economically from the oceans. So we started out uh, with harvesting uranium. This actually works. And it works where it's competitive now with land-based or terrestrial-based harvest mining of uranium, if you include the fact that once you mine the uranium, you've now totally trashed the zone. And uh, here's another little th evidence of intelligent design. If I take a five megawatt wind turbine, and this is actually not a cartoon, this is a real picture-ish, you know, the concept. Five megawatt offshore wind turbine and these little net guys going up and down, and I'll explain this in a minute. A five megawatt wind turbine offshore will harvest the equivalent of five megawatts of uranium for a nuclear power plant. Now, I know some people say, oh, I love my squirrels and nuts and twigs, nuclear power. Oh. I still think that there's a bright way that nuclear power could be done, and we have enough nukes now. We can't shut them all off right away. Well, we might as well get the uranium for them nicely as opposed to digging up Africa or uh, southern Virginia soon. Turns out what the key is is these uh, whoop, little, little wiffle ball things. They're on a string, so it's like a, a rope, bead rope, and you pack these hollow plastic spheres with holes with the polymer that absorbs the uranium. Now, it's not just uranium that you can get from this. The chemists can do magic chemistry happiness stuff. To, you can engineer the polymers to absorb whatever you want, including when you get uranium, actually you get 10 times more vanadium than uranium. So for vanadium redox batteries for energy storage, it turns out, whoa, there it is. And uh, it turns out that if you were to deploy these, let's see if I have this on the next slide. Oh, OK, so here's Maha. This is testing these things at the Mass Maritime Academy. We tested them in storms and high currents. This is a 110 scale. It really works. This is not just some happy academicness. Whoop, oh, I want to go back. Back! Back, back. She just did a finish the study that we off to get published in happy, happy Academic Journal for because it's important to have good peer review. If you go to the Gulf Coast, and there are these things called offshore oil platforms. Sorry, I use that word, oil. And there's hundreds of them, and a lot of them are no longer in production. And the oil companies 
fought like crazy to have someone, I can't imagine they did this, in Washington who all of a sudden said, oh, you know what? No problem. Leave those things there. You don't have to pay tens of millions of dollars to take each one down. Can you imagine that? And I'm glad that they did that. Because if we just take the existing offshore oil platforms that are no longer producing and hung off of them, go back. These kind of, whoop, these kind of, it's obviously not working for me. These kind of dudes that are now the polymers are ready to absorb cobalt in the Gulf of Mexico, we could be absorbing enough cobalt from the existing offshore oil platforms to make five million Teslas a year. We don't have to fight the Chinese for control of the Congo. We've got cobalt coming out of our ears here. Isn't that wild? I think that's pretty cool. And cost competitively also. See, one over sad equals happy. So uh, Maha did all that great stuff. Now wind energy. And there's all these plots of wind and there's a lot in the middle. This is, you know, you've heard the middle of the United States often called the Saudi Arabia of wind. Some people say, well, yeah, that's fine. We can't get the power out. And uh, Luke, my next student coming up, he's not going to talk about it. But part of his thesis was how we could get it out cheap, but maybe next conference. Anyway, the moral of the story is um, you hear people say, well, wind, it's, it's, it's there, but it's subsidized. OK, no problem. We'll fix that. So first of all, let's talk about subsidies. Where do the subsidies come from? They come from people paying taxes. People pay taxes who have jobs. There's a huge flock of people who pay taxes who work in the wind industry. There's a lot more people working in wind than work in coal, by the way. And I have no problem with coal. We have some really fun things we call coal-volution. Maybe that's again for the next conference. We can fix that, too. It's the fastest growing jobs in the US, the lowest impact of wildlife. Don't tell me about birds until you're ready to eat your cats. Cats kill about twice as many birds as all the turbines predicted. And forget that. Get rid of your skyscrapers. They're the number one wrecker of birds. Um, my friends in Texas are the best. They say, oh, well, we know uh, when the migratory birds come through, we know it by Doppler radar. We just turn the wind turbines off until they pass. So that was pretty cool. Um, but still, it's the lowest form of energy of all energy that has any sort of tax incentive. It's the way to go, but it's still too expensive. It's too expensive. So I always ask, when you whine about something's too expensive, I don't think like an engineer first. I want you to tell me why. And if you can tell me why it's expensive, you know, then I ask myself the question, what is the physics behind the cost? Because if I understand the physics behind the cost, I can write an equation. And if I can write an equation, I can look for the opportunity. Now, how many people here are like uh, uh, attached romantically to someone at home? Okay, and the rest of you all are shy? Okay, now, <clears throat> or maybe you aren't yet, but you were thinking, oh, that'd be kind of nice. Okay, so ready for this? You come home. Hello, dear. It's time for whoopee. Please step this way. That doesn't really get it, does it? It's like, so what I look for is the, hey, baby, woo! I look for the nonlinearities in my physics. Linear is really boring. So in wind turbines, I had a very, very uh, 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 a software friend who made a lot of money, and he said, I want to do something in wind. I said, he said, what do I do? I said, I don't know. Let's go to NREL and let's look at the data. Where's the data tell us? And it turns out the data tells us one third of the cost of a big wind turbine is the pole. It's not the gearbox with the hyperactive hyperloaded ginsum or the generator with the multi bifunctional polar aspirators. It's the pole because it's 300 tons of steel. Ow. So I, always, I ask, what's the physics? Turns out the physics is the pole can only be four meters in diameter, so you can take it from the factory to go into the bridge. Now, the pole has to be strong enough so when you <laughs> blow on it in a storm, it doesn't go <laughs> That's bad. 
The physics of the pole is the stiffness goes with the diameter to the third power times the thickness of the steel. And you have to know we can go through the calculus lesson, but maybe after dessert. The weight goes with the diameter times the thickness, because it's just the area. So right away, ding, aha, opportunity. Because when you have a nonlinear thing of goodness that you have to balance against a linear thing of ouchness, I guarantee you that I can make the nonlinear win. So it turns out that if I could make the pole this big, this optimal size, I can use one third less steel. Isn't that cool? But you can't ship it. So a lot of people recognize this problem. They say, OK, no problem. I'll cut it in half, and I'll bolt it together, blah, 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 blah. See, engineers like to think complicated in general. Me, I'm lazy. I want to spend more time outside with my friends, hanging out, scuba diving, you know, riding my bike. So I got to make stuff real simple and cheap so I don't have to do so many part drawings. Okay? So we use reciprocity. We just said instead of making the pole and shipping it, we're just going to bring the factory to the site, put it together in a simple little machine, and make the poles on site. Pretty obvious. How do you do it? You can't. So that's all right. We did it. We invented a new way of taking steel plate and wrapping it. We built the one uh, seven scale machine. It actually worked the way the theory said it would. We got very good funding from the Department of Energy, blah, blah, blah. And uh, we built it. We built our first power, our towers. We are certified. Uh, we're in Colorado. This is the layout. I don't have a lot of time. And the key was trapezoids. So if you're interested, you can read about it. We'll talk about it more. Everyone said, wow, that's amazing. Here's the layout of the whole factory. We partnered with Vestas and GE and all the big wind turbine producers, big giant company that makes the big machines. This train has left the station. It's going to work and cuts the cost of wind energy by 10%. Not only that, here's the really funny thing. Maine, you know that big thing up in the corner? There's not a whole lot of people up in Maine because it's almost all forest owned by paper companies. But not many people use that much paper, so the companies are trying to wonder what to do. Now, Maine has six gigawatts of wind potential. Yeah. Hmm. At 80 meters, which is the current height, 80 to 100 meters poles. If I could give you a 140 meter pole for the same price as the 80 meter pole, Maine would have 60 gigawatts of wind power available. Now, OK, reality, that's about 30 gigawatts 24-7. But that's 5% of the entire United States 24-7 power generation. Isn't that cool? And it's going to be cheaper than if you were to actually burn coal. Ha! Huh? <laughs> and people in Maine actually want this stuff. All made possible by Whoop. Doop. physics. Physics doesn't care if it kills you or if it makes you rich. It just doesn't care. Okay. So all right, let's go on and have some more fun. We're really excited. Oh, there was our first poll. I know I don't know if I'm allowed to show these personal pictures, but there's my poll. Whoop. See, I went by fast. The next thing is. How are you going to store the power? Because all this wind doesn't always blow. Right? So we got to do something in between. So the other cool little thing, and yeah, we're working in battery companies, and it's going to be a multivariable diet and blah, 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 is uh, if you have a lower lake or the ocean, that's a pretty big lake, you can pump the water up to a reservoir, and then the water goes back down through the pumps when you're done. Very old technology. But if you do it, it's about 80% round trip efficiency. And it actually is cheaper than batteries because it lasts forever and it doesn't create a lot of toxic waste from used batteries, blah, blah. But no one wants a, a pumped hydro system in the backyard. There's not enough fresh water. Uh, maybe. The interesting thing is, again, where you look at a symbiotic system, pump it in and out uh, offshore sh with shellfish beds. So the shellfish get nice, fresh water without poop, making them need things. Couple it with a desalination system, and now we get rid of the problem of desalination systems. The brine goes out and poisons everything unless you have long, expensive outflow pipes. Because again, intelligent design is that, forget all the, the words there. And if I have one million people and I want to provide energy storage for those one million people so they can be re totally renewable power, and I want to give everybody 500 liters of fresh water a day, I need 
to pump about 20 cubic meters of seawater up from sea bloop, to 500 you know, meters, OK, 1,500 feet high, and then bloop, goes down every day, up and down. And that'll give me all the energy storage and all the fresh water I want. And for one million people, I need one square kilometer of that upper lake. That's it. So in LA region, there are 20 million people in kind of the greater LA Gopolis, San Diego. So I'd need 20 square kilometers. Oh my good. Wait a second. Nonlinear, nonlinear, square kilometers. Hmm. If I made a reservoir, let's call it five kilometers by five kilometers. So on the total perimeter, it's only a half a marathon. That would serve, I could have the entire Southern California totally non-dependent on natural water, so I'd save the Owens Valley, totally 100% renewables because we've got the sunshine and the wind. Huh. Isn't that amazing? It's all very doable. We'll get to how we pay for it very simply in a minute. Okay. So, uh, and uh, this is, I got to speed up. So here, I'm just going through the numbers and stuff. So I was in Berlin a couple of years ago. And oh, the one number you want to uh, keep, take a look at, it's too small. If we really do this on a big scale and we're fully automated and fully efficient, it would cost about $5 per watt per person. In the worst case, about $10 per watt per person. What that means is that the average American uses about two kilowatts of power on average, and that's the lights, the cooking, the everything we do. And I can prove that because there are 300 million people about, and our 24-7 average power generation in the United States is about 600 gigawatts. 600 gigawatts divided by 2,000, uh, I'm sorry, by 300 million is 2,000 watts. So if I took for the United States and I spent Let's say it was the most outrageous price, $10. That buys the wind turbines, the solar energy, the grid connects, this uh, uh, renewable, this energy storage, everything. That means that 10,000 times two, $10 a watt time. Oh, wow, for $20,000, I can have for the rest of my life 24-7 renewable power and water. $20,000. That's so much money. Just think about what uh, the average budget people spend, and if I took $20,000 and made that a 20-year mortgage, that's, that's hardly anything. David, you can do the numbers real quick. What's the monthly payment on $20,000 mortgage at 5% over 20 years? OK, someone's got a calculator here. It basically works out to, if I give up Starbucks, uh, some of those websites that charge, <laughs> and maybe instead of Oh, quick, order something from Amazon now. Oh, shit, I forgot. I got Prime. It doesn't matter. Let's order it again. Then you'd pay for it, and you wouldn't ever feel it. It's really that funny. OK, so onward, faster. Oh, so when I was in Berlin, I was pointing out to my Berlinish friends, and, and, and first of all, my hat's off. I took it off. To my German friends that welcome the migrants uh, from the horrifically damaged places in the planet. And then some people say, oh, that's terrible. That's good. That's very bad and blah, blah, blah. And the people say, no, that's very good. And all I know is, is that the numbers say that to take one migrant person and fully integrate them into the German system, it'll cost about 100,000 euros. But for the, remember, we can only spend 20,000. So for one fifth the cost, we could uh, uh, create paradise on Earth and these other places. Uh, here we can put it everywhere. Here we can, here's where we'd put these sites in Southern California. And if the California say, no, we don't want it, not in my backyard, no problem. Mexico can build a great big wall to keep the gringos north. And they'll pay, the gringos are going to pay for that damn wall by uh, the money they send to Mexico for renewable energy and fresh water. How about that? <laughs> in the Red Sea, we can do it. Iran, oh, we can fix Iran. We have a we're working on a paper now that if Iran just took what they're spending to maybe potentially do things that maybe potentially we think we may not want them to do, boof, they could be totally renewable energy in 20 years. Um, and in Spagnola, and that, oh, look here, more intelligent design. Did you realize that, what? Go back. Back! The crop circles. No, these are not space alien crop circles. This is the pitch of, wind, uh, of, of center pivot irrigation. Now, again, intelligent design, the optimal size for a center pivot irrigation system, the length is what? 500 meters. These are one kilometer 
diameter of circles. What's the optimal spacing for five megawatt wind turbines? What do you think? It's that. So everywhere where we're building all these things to grow crops, just put a, and there's nothing in the middle because it's so you put a big wind turbine. And then now you will simultaneously grow all your food and all the energy, which then goes to the IFRO system, which now provides the water back to grow all your food. Isn't that cool? It all works together. Intelligent design, baby. Stop. OK, an automated warehouse. The day of air, air culture is done. Broom. All these good things are happening. Luke is going to talk about that. And we have posters on all this stuff. My students are doing uh, we'll work with some of your students, even though you don't realize it yet. And uh, investing in the future. I think taxes are dog water. I don't believe in, and I'm not going to pay any carbon tax, damn it. I can do it without having to trust the government to do anything. You think you're going to trust the government to do something? Next government may not undo it. We just saw that happen. So David helped, and we wrote this interesting paper about how black energy companies, coal, oil, all these dudes, if you took a percentage of your profits and you invested in green, and it wouldn't hurt you because now you own the asset, so it actually makes financial sense. And in 20 years, you evolved, and we can actually show that it'll speed up the rate of renewableization, that it'll compensate for the amount of carbon you put into the air. So we have that paper coming out. Uh, we can give copies of that. Hope, oh, don't go away, so how you do it? Look, if you just took the spare auto industrial capacity of just hanging out, in 22 years, you could have half of all the United States wind power, energy on wind power. So the industrial capacity to do all this is there. You don't have to change anything. You just have to manage it better. And the same thing with the world GDP. If you just took 5% of the world GDP, in 28 years, the entire world could be renewable uh, uh, electricity. At slovenly, whoop, slovenly, 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 uh-oh. Uh, US consumption rates of power. Isn't that amazing? The whole world could have our style of living renewably in 28 years by just spending 5% of the world GDP per year on renewables. Good, they took him away from me. <laughs> now, I want to point out that all you damn scientists and engineers are going to rot in hell. And I'll be in one of the outer circles throwing shit at you. Unless you learn to communicate to the vast majority of people, and the vast majority of people, oop. I'm getting closer to you. I, I have heard no one here talk about faith. I, all I ever hear about is, oh, God would never let us burn. I've read a lot of these religious texts. We were bad. You know, remember this, from a country music song, Eve was wearing one of those low cut leaves. And that was it. That was the end of it. And, uh, and then they, they tried to wash us away. That didn't work. So I, I'm not going to try to wash you away any work, but you're on your own now. That's how I kind of summarize everything. And uh, so I want us more to think about uh, there is a very, for people who, who hold, for, this is just two of the texts, two texts here, and then from the Quran also, that, and you can find similar examples uh, from Buddhist scriptures, Confucians uh, uh, writings that the faithful people of the earth who, who really live and, and, and depend upon the wisdom and, and, and these teachings, it says, be nice. Be nice to your planet. Take care of each other and your planet. And I think that's a message that needs to be driven home, not just, we have done the calculations that you all are going to die. It should be, hey, you know, your God wants you to be nice to your planet. And you, he, 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 she, it gave you physics, physics. Use it. Okay, so that's the, that's the end. <laughs> yes. <laughs>